Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today I have another family involved true crime story that I'm gonna be telling you with the help of the family of the victim. And this has been something I've done now four times, I think this is the fourth one. And sometimes I get kind of mixed comments I mentioned in the last one, but I just wanna point out that I will not be tolerating any hate comments towards these family members who have been through hell and back and are still here to tell their stories. So anything directed at them will get you banned from my channel, friend. But today's story is incredibly sad. I'm going to be telling you about Alexis Patino. Now this is a very small case. It has pretty much no coverage. There was barely anything to work with so you know luckily I got to work directly with her family but honestly they don't have much to work with either so there's not that many details in this you know that's the nature of telling some of these stories that just don't get as much coverage you will be seeing clips of Alexis's mom Monica in this video and her sisters will be joining in as well so let's get right into Alexis's story hi my name is Monica I have four daughters We'll be talking about Alexis today. She was 22 years old when she passed. This is Mariah, she's 18. And this is Alyssa, she's 15. And later you'll get to meet my nine-year-old. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Alexis and her growing up. Alexis came into this world seven weeks early. What I can really say about that is she was so eager and ambitious to meet the world. From the very beginning, she was a go-getter and there was like no stopping her. Um, so I really had to keep up with her. Some of our favorite memories were just plain patty cake to slide and lemonade. Those are like my most favorite memories because no matter where we were in line at the market or at the store, we would always just keep ourselves entertained and play. I can say one of my favorite memories, like as when we were younger, is that Alexis was just like always there. She was always like my second mom. Not really because like we're like best friends still though, because you know, moms are more. Moms strict. can be friends. But, but she was literally my hero. Literally, every, everything she could do, I knew that I could do because if she did it, I could do it. And I think that's what's so hard now, today, is you know, her life is cut short. There's gonna be a time where I'm gonna be approached doing things that she hasn't done because it was ended so shortly. And she was just my hero. I always looked up to her. Um, I just remember us always being, you know, playing on the Game Boys late at night, hiding it if we heard our parents walking down the, you know, down the hall. One of my favorite memories or just anything me and her would like connect with was always making fun of each other. We would always make fun of each other or like there would be days where I pretend I was sick and I wouldn't go to school and she'd be like, what are you doing home? And we'd go to Starbucks, we'd go to like to eat. So that was probably one of my favorite memories because it was just me and her, like just us. So Alexis Patino was 22 years old at the time and she was born in the San Fernando Valley area and raised in Hemet, California. She was the oldest daughter of four girls. Alexis was an amazing sister. I honestly <clears throat> couldn't have picked a better sister to lead and be a role model to these girls. Disciplining them, to being their sister, to taking them places, to talking to them, and to guide them as well. Like Alexis had amazing grades throughout. She was just literally an amazing role model. She was described as an amazing daughter, sister, and friend, and was full of life, laughter, and was also described as being very smart, bright, and super ambitious. And a lot of her friends said she was a great person to go to when you needed advice or someone to talk to. Her mother said that she did not know how to fail. Everything that she set her mind to, she would do. She was very, you know, ambitious. During high school, she was involved in varsity cheerleading. She was also involved in AVID and the student body government, where she was friends with many different people. She was on the cheer team, she was in honors classes, so she was very busy and very active, very smart, and really social. This is so sweet. Wow. Aww, she's being nice, guys. With the bestie. Hi. Oh, so cute. 
just an all around really good person. Alexis was said to make friends with pretty much anyone that she came across and could get along with anybody. She was said to have a way about her that made people feel like she knew them for years. Like she was just so comfortable with people that she had just met. And after high school, she started working at a Starbucks and she eventually got associate's degrees in math and science at Mount San Jacinto Community College. And it also been recently accepted to Arizona State University. And she actually wanted to become a nurse. Um, she really wanted to help people. So two weeks prior to her death, she had just started a job working at a local elementary school. She was like an after school coordinator. So she was doing Starbucks at the same time as well. Alexis loved her job at Starbucks and she really just loved everything that she set her mind to. Otherwise she just wouldn't do it. That was just her. She really loved her coworkers. Alexis always gave everyone the utmost respect and attention and uh, it's amazing how many lives she affected. Alexis really loved helping people. She genuinely loved life, loved people, and she wanted to be a nurse for that reason because she genuinely wanted to help people. Um, unfortunately, around the last several weeks of Alexis' life, um, thinking back on it, it started to really kind of like fall apart. Now, this is where I don't have a whole lot of detail, but Alexis had a boyfriend and I'm going to conceal his identity. I actually don't even know his name. We're just going to refer to him as the boyfriend. Alexis met him about a year or year and a half prior through a friend and six months into their relationship, her boyfriend actually moved to New York and they kept a long distance relationship. But shortly after he returned, they decided to move in together. And this was about a year and two months of being together. So they're already moving in together. And many of her friends that had met him said that he could be a little bit controlling and was very jealous. She moved out several months prior to her passing. We promised to see each other all the time and meet up for dinner once a week. And like prior to her passing, that really didn't happen. She just became so distant. Her friends um, saw less of her because they just didn't care to be around her and her boyfriend. Not that they didn't care to be around her, but they just didn't care for her boyfriend's attitude and negativity. And I kind of reflect back on that and how, you know, maybe sad it probably made her feel and how distant she became with us as a family because we were always just so close. And that's really heartbreaking for me to reflect back on that because like the last two weeks of her life, I probably saw her twice. And coming from a really close family, and seeing each other every day, having that bond break, is just really heart-wrenching. And it affected us all in different ways. It affected my mom so much, like the moment she moved out. And the fact that it was with this man who she did not approve of. I, as a sister, always try to support her no matter what, because that's what sisters do, you know? Like, parents are going to be parents, say, so you know, you can't date this person, I don't, I don't like this person. But sisters are going to be there to, you know, sugarcoat it a little bit and be like, Girl, do what you want, you know, you only live once, do do what makes you happy. But as I can see, I was younger, I didn't really, you know, see the bigger picture as a parent would. And me, I always just try to be like, mom, like let her move on, you know, like I would always try to be there for Alexis. But in a way, I did see it deep down that it was, it, the relationship wasn't right. So Alexis met her boyfriend through a mutual friend of theirs. I had seen him outside the window. They had went out on a date and I can see the way he was kind of pressuring her, like asking her questions and pulling on her. And like Alexis already wanted to kind of come inside the house because it was getting late and I was already calling her and texting her. So immediately from that point, I had already got a feel for him and it wasn't a good feeling. I right away talked to her like, what was he telling you? Like, what was so important? He kept on like shrugging on her and they had just met. This was probably like their first or second date. I did my best to give him the opportunity to um, prove himself and not just think negative. So that's all really a parent can do. I noticed um, 
bruises on Alexis. I started to get a little concerned um, when I did notice them. Uh, she'd call me when they'd um, argue and stuff and I kind of talked to her about the situations and he just showed a lot of aggression so that's really when I started to get concerned and notice little things here and there. I wasn't okay with the idea of her moving in um, with her boyfriend but I knew that I had to accept the fact that she was growing up. I was happy for her because you know it's kind of exciting you know to move out and like oh it's a new life you know different. I was really really sad at the same time because when I had realized her room was empty it it hurt my heart. So the day before Alexis passed it was a Sunday and um, we just loved to come together as a family and watch football. It had been at least a good five days since I had seen Alexis. I remember getting a call from her and she was asking me where I was and she was going to come stop by the house. Mariah ended up doing her makeup and they just kind of enjoyed and you know enjoyed some sister time. Going through some things that day with her boyfriend, playing phone tag, they were supposed to meet up and they weren't, um, that she ended up kind of canceling out. Um, her plans with me to meet up to watch the game because she was waiting on him and um, little did I know that that would be our last conversation was when she said don't worry mom I don't work all day tomorrow I'll come hang out with you and she sent me the little angel emoji so on the night of November 19th of 2017, Alexis and her boyfriend were at the Tilted Kilt. One of Alexis's friends actually worked there and was her waitress that evening. Now, a lot of these details cannot be confirmed, but people have said that she was possibly in an argument with him at dinner. Now, apparently while they were arguing, her boyfriend got upset and left the restaurant about an hour before Alexis left. And after leaving the Tilted Kilt, when she got to her apartment, she made a few calls to friends and one of her sisters. Alexis had called me the night before she had passed away. And um, she called me, but I answered the phone, I picked it up, and I heard some sniffling, you know, like somebody's been crying, like, and I said, hello, Alexis, hello, and there was no answer, and then it declined. So I was like, okay, let me just wait a few minutes, see if she calls me again. And, um, well, because I called and she didn't answer, so then I just waited a little bit. And then she finally called me back, and then she's like, hey, what are you doing? I was like, nothing, you know, just clean my room, chilling. And she's like, um, or I asked her, I was like, w where are you at? Like, you know, what are you doing? And she was like, oh, I just got home. I was like, where's your boyfriend? And she was like, oh, um, I don't know, he's out, he's, he's annoying, or this and that. And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, are you okay? And she's like, she's like, yeah. And I was like, are you sure? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And then she asked me again. She said, where are you at? And I said, Alexis, I'm home. I told you that already. And she was kind of being, you know, um, repetitive of the things she was saying, like asking me. And I, then I realized, like, I was like, I was like, this girl, like, drunk or something? So I'm like, okay, like, you know, she's safe. Home. Her last phone call of the night was at 11.13 p.m. when she called her boyfriend. He answered the call and cell phone records show that they talked for about two minutes. Now, it wasn't until like 2.30 or 3 a.m. when her boyfriend decided to come home. And when he got there, he claims that he was not able to get into the apartment, that it was locked. And he did have a key because they did live together, but he indicated that she had locked probably like the deadbolt and so he wasn't able to get in because he said it locked from the inside that he wasn't able to unlock with a key from the outside. So he continued to knock on the door, but there was no answer. So he ended up calling the police and telling them that he was locked out of his apartment. So the police came and knocked on the door and no one answered. So apparently her boyfriend said that he would just sleep in the car that night. Now, we're not sure if the police actually checked to see if the building was unlocked or not. That would have determined a lot. So her boyfriend claimed that he slept in the car for a few hours and at 6 49 the next morning he woke up and he found a way to get in the house through the kitchen window the report reads that he entered the house because the window was slightly ajar and he was able to open it and get in now what's interesting is they were three stories up the kitchen window was not attached to the balcony so he indicated that he had to actually step on the railing and like lean way far over to get to the window he claims he entered the apartment at that point and that's where he found Alexis 
laying on the floor, completely unresponsive. He said that she was not breathing and he believed that she had killed herself. So deputies arrived at 6.57 a.m. They found, you know, Alexis lying unresponsive on the floor and she was found with one single stab wound to her abdomen. I had um, woke up for work and um, when I woke up, I seen that I had a text message from her boyfriend and it had read, when was the last time you spoke with Alexis? And just the way the question was asked, it was so direct. I right away jumped up and got really concerned and I called Alexis' phone. At that moment, he answered and was really distraught and told me that he had just found Alexis lying down with blood coming out of her mouth. So I right away knew to stay calm and keep him calm so I can get some answers and I right away asked him if she was breathing. He said no. I said, did you dial 911? And he said yes. And so immediately I jumped in my car and drove over there. When I got there, I saw yellow tape up. There was one sheriff there. There was no ambulance, no fire truck. I just went into like this numb mode and um, they didn't allow me upstairs or anything like that. We were there for probably about eight hours and um, detectives started showing up. Now the boyfriend did not attempt CPR or anything. He actually said he didn't touch her at all. But around that morning at 11.20 a.m. her boyfriend was arrested for murder with malice. But due to lack of evidence, her boyfriend was released the next day. Now he did have an alibi because he was at a casino um, before he came home. So he did have proof that he was there and they got home at three, but no one has any idea what he did from three to 6.50. She was my little twin. She was a replica of me, but better. The resemblance between Monica Perez and her oldest daughter, Alexis Patino, is remarkable. Monica had Alexis at a young age and because of that, they grew up together almost like twin sisters. I loved her so much. She's my everything. The oldest of four sisters, Alexis was the guardian angel of their family, a 22-year-old woman who family members say was as strong as she was beautiful. She was always so kind to everybody. Never have I ever seen her be rude toward anyone. Now, despite not having any answers, her family has really ruled out suicide. Her family said it was just not in her character and they don't believe she would ever kill herself. She didn't have any medical history. She didn't take any medication. She did drink on the weekends, but never showed any sign of serious, serious depression. She would never, ever hurt herself. Suicide was never, never a thought. Never. Monica says Alexis's boyfriend was the one who found her body and at first deputies arrested him, but then later released him pending further investigation. Friends say the couple had a troubled relationship. Plain and simple, if she would have never met him, she would still be alive. Maybe it could have been an accident and then I think about it again and I'm like, no. Monica says investigators need just a little more evidence to give Alexis the justice she deserves. And that's why Monica is hoping someone will come forward and give her family the closure they desperately need. She was killed. She was murdered. And just to know that she suffered for a second absolutely kills us. Now what's interesting is the police did end up saying that they do not believe it was suicide after getting statements from family and friends, but the coroner was not able to come to a conclusion of how she died. Now two of her friends disclosed to police about the boyfriend's somewhat abusive behavior before she died, how he was controlling, acted jealous, how they would fight. One of her friends said that at one point Alexis even had a bump on her head and asked if she could stay at her place for a while. And and several of her friends ended up actually calling police and telling them about things that they knew about her relationship. So an autopsy was performed the following day and the coroner ruled the death as undetermined. Now the autopsy did show over nine different like bruises, scrapes, abrasions. There was even a laceration to her chin and two above her eyebrow. Her family was just devastated as you can imagine. So a memorial service was held for Alexis on Friday, December 1st, 2017 at the Mill 
Miller Jones Mortuary. Now, it is still unknown what happened to Alexis, but one thing is for sure, this girl deserves justice. Her family deserves to know the truth about what really happened to her. Now, obviously, suicide by stab wound is like one of the least common ways to commit suicide. So that raises question even more about what really happened. According to a study in 2012, only 1.6 to 3% of all suicides were from a stab wound. Now there is a petition on change.org that you can sign to help Alexis's family. And this is to urge the Riverside County Sheriff's Department to submit her case to the Riverside County District Attorney's Office for further review. Alexis had a lot of friends. A lot of people really looked up to her, admired her. She was a beautiful person inside and out. Now there is a possibility that she could have had a stalker. At the end of the day, we don't know that Alexis's boyfriend did this to her. It is possible that maybe she had some type of stalker. I mean, she was so pretty and she was at Tilted Kilt. Someone could have followed her home. Although I do think there would be a bit more evidence. So it's very, very confusing. Now I made an Instagram account that her mom is going to run that you can follow at justice.for.alexis. I will link it below, um, but that way you can stay up to date with any new information that comes out or any developments with the case. Also, you can send you know your words of support to her family that way. Um, it's a great way to connect with victims. I so, so appreciate you guys. Every time I do these videos, the amount of love that is sent to the person that I am doing the video for is amazing. And I'm really, really grateful. It's something so cool that we can do this and you know create this community where we lift other people up. And I just, I think it's really, really awesome. So I hope to do more cases like this in the future. One of the things that I miss about Alexis is her affection. Alexis was very, very affectionate. She was like a big baby. It was so funny. It's like we'd all be in the house, and I swear when Alexis came home, it was like a star just walked in the door. Like, oh, Alexis is home. I just really miss her. I just even feed her, sleep on the couch. <laughs> she could sit down for a minute and fall asleep anywhere. <laughs> I miss Alexis so much. I miss us in general, just all of us together being a family again. Nothing, you know, we'll always be broken. I'll always feel this empty peace in my heart because she's no longer with us. I miss us laughing and singing in the car forever. I miss just sleeping in the bed with her. We know I would always sleep with her sometimes. I miss her presence because she was our best friend. We have each other and now that she's gone, it just feels broken. It's not something we'd like to admit because I know we still have each other, but it's like it's never going to be the same. It breaks my heart that we can never see her in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. She's gone and that's that. She's just so beautiful and so, she's just such an amazing person and I don't understand why this happened to her. I miss okay. Alexis because I miss her hugs and everything she did, her presence, her laugh. I just, everything about her I miss because she was just an amazing person. I miss having a sister like her. I miss her a lot and honestly all of my other sisters are kind of like her but not exactly the same. I just miss her hug she and I miss sleeping with her. What I would really like for everyone to remember about Alexis is she was an amazing, beautiful, talented young girl with a whole lot of life ahead of her. She didn't deserve to be found dead the way she was. Like She didn't deserve it at all. She had an amazing smile and an amazing personality and she just loved everyone. And I just want everybody to remember that she was an amazing person and she touched a lot of lives. I just want people to just remember her as she was because she was perfect. And I know nobody's perfect, but 
to us. She was our angel, you know? Like, I just miss her so much and it's just hard for me to even say how I want people to remember her, you know? Like, it's hard for me to sit here and say that she's still gone because I'm still hoping to see her come through that door one day. I know that she meant a lot to, to a lot of people because she was such a beautiful soul. But I want people to fight with us because Alexis is gone and she's not here. She doesn't have a voice anymore. She can't stand here and say what happened. We can only fight for her because we are the ones who are suffering every single day without her. Her friends who love her are suffering. Just the community is suffering because she was just such an amazing person and she is no longer here. And how are we supposed to move on when we don't have any answers? How am I supposed to continue moving forward in my life with nothing? I'm not okay with accidental death. I'm not okay with I don't know. I'm not okay with that. This is not something to be like, I don't know about it and move on. This is a life, a beautiful life that is gone. And we have no answers. We don't know what happened to Alexis. That is why we're reaching out to everybody because somebody may know something and they may not even know it. We just need answers and she deserves the justice. So we'd also like to raise some awareness. If you know someone that is in a bad relationship or there's a problem in their relationship or it's toxic, please, Please be that voice. Please notify someone. There's so many hotlines and numbers that people can call to reach out to to get the help that they need or and deserve before something like this happens. I also wanted to point out that one way that you can really help Alexis and her family is to write directly to the Riverside Sheriff's Department or the Riverside District Attorney's Office. I will have both of those in the description box and an email address as well. So you can write them either, you know, the old fashioned way or you can write them over the internet.